To get a high score in the OET speaking role play, you need to know about these. These are the two assessment criteria for OET speaking, and they show you how OET examiners grade your speaking role play conversations. As you can see, there's a lot of information in these criteria. But don't panic. In this video, I'm going to give you this, a checklist that simplifies the criteria into eight easy to remember steps. We're going to use this checklist to analyze a not so good role play answer before reviewing a high scoring sample answer. So before we look at the role play card for these sample answers, let's quickly look at the eight checklist items. The first item is this. Introduce yourself in a polite and friendly way and begin building a relationship with the patient using sympathetic language and tone of voice. This first item comes from the clinical communication criteria. This is the first of the two OET criteria examiners use to assess your role play. It focuses on evaluating your ability to communicate effectively and accurately in a healthcare setting. As you can see here, there are indicators of relationship building described in the criteria. They include initiating the interaction appropriately, demonstrating an attentive and respectful attitude, adopting a non-judgmental approach, and showing empathy for the patient's feelings, predicament, and emotional state. Our first checklist item is a good succinct summary of these four indicators. As you likely know, the two role play scenarios in the OET speaking test take the form of conversations between a healthcare professional, you, and a patient or a patient's carer, the interlocutor. Building a good professional relationship with a patient or carer is important. Often patients will be feeling uncomfortable, anxious, or afraid. You can begin addressing this as soon as you start the conversation by introducing yourself in a polite and friendly way and using sympathetic language and tone of voice to make your patient feel more comfortable. This is covered in the first checklist item. The second item in the checklist is this. Inquire about your patient's condition, listen to their concerns, and be responsive to their questions to better understand their perspective or circumstances. This item also comes from the clinical communication criteria. Here are the indicators for understanding and incorporating the patient's perspective. As you can see, this indicator refers to how well you listen and respond to your patient. This checklist item also relates to the instructions found on the role play card. On screen, you can see the role play card for the sample tasks we'll look at shortly. You can see the first prompt asks you to find out about the difficulties the patient has been experiencing. This is a typical first instruction for an OET speaking role play card. The third and fourth checklist item also comes from the clinical communication criteria. The third checklist item is gather information throughout the conversation, moving from open questions to closed questions summarize and give clarifications when necessary to make sure the patient is understanding you. This relates to the indicators for information gathering. These indicators refer to how effectively you ask your patient questions in ways to elicit useful answers from your patient throughout the conversation. For example, at the start of the conversation, use open questions such as, what symptoms have you been experiencing? to get general information. Then, as the conversation continues, move on to closed questions to gather specific information, such as, do you have a headache? Or, are you feeling any pain? The fourth checklist item is this. Give information and advice that is clear and concise. Give simple instructions and advice, avoiding the use of overly technical medical language. This is a summary of the indicators for information giving. These indicators require that you be clear, give concise, simple instructions or advice, don't use technical medical language the patient will struggle to understand, and give your advice as suggestions, not orders. 
So we now have on our checklist four points that cover the whole clinical communication criteria. If you want to download this checklist to help with your practice, click the link in the description. We've included the checklist in addition to a transcript of the high-scoring sample response we'll listen to later in this video. Now we're going to look at the next four items on the checklist. These are all related to the second OET assessment criteria called the linguistic criteria. The fifth checklist item is use clear speech and pronunciation. This is a summary of the top band of the intelligibility subcriterion, which is all about being easily understood. The sixth checklist item is use smooth, fluent speech without hesitation. This is the information found in the top band of the fluency subcriterion. Fluency is the smoothness of your speech. It includes finding the right pace, not too slow or fast, using natural pauses and avoiding stops and starts and saying too many ums and ahs. The seventh checklist item is explain technical concepts in a way that is easy to understand. This is a summary of the appropriateness of language subcriterion, which is all about using suitable language and explaining things to patients in a simple, clear way. This also should take into account how you might communicate with patients of different ages and backgrounds. Try not to use technical and medical terms in language. To complete our checklist, we have one more item. Number eight, use a wide range of grammar and vocabulary. That one's quite simple. It's a summary of the top band for the resources of grammar and expression subcriterion, which, as you can see, is about whether you can use a range of grammar, vocabulary, and idioms accurately and flexibly. This includes using different phrases to communicate the same idea. Okay, great. Our simplified criteria checklist is ready. Remember, you can download a copy of the checklist by clicking the link in the description. Let's now use the checklist to analyze two sample role plays. First, let's take a moment to look at the sample role play card. Role play cards have a format with three sections, the setting, the scenario, and the tasks or prompts. As you can see here, the setting is the general surgery ward. Though brief, this is important information because it describes the context of your conversation. This paragraph explains the scenario. The scenario identifies the key people involved in the conversation. In this scenario, you are the nurse and the interlocutor is the patient. In other scenarios, the interlocutor might play the role of a guardian or parent. The scenario tells you about the subject of the conversation. In this one, the patient is scheduled to have a hernia operation. The scenario also gives you important information about the patient. In this case, the patient's job requires him or her to do heavy lifting. You are told that the patient seems unaware of how the post-op recovery will affect their ability to work. Finally, there are the prompts. These are shown as a list of bullet points that you must talk about in your conversation. Okay, let's first use our checklist to analyze a not so good sample conversation. What I want you to do now is first, listen to this sample role play between Sally and a patient, John, using the scenario based on our role play card. Remember, this is an example of a not so good interaction. Let's listen. I guess you're the hernia guy? Yeah, yes. Your operation is um, tomorrow, right? Yes. Well, hernias are painful. The operation might fix that. The surgeon will use a laparoscope to um, push the inguinal hernia back in your stomach and put some parietex mesh in to fix the hole. This is to make the weak place strong again. Oh, okay, so I'm, I'm going to have a big cut. The surgeon puts three holes or four holes in your groin to put the laparoscope in. It's small. Then we um, put a dressing on the, um, the wound and you can go home. Ouch, that sounds like it will really hurt. Well, the, the dressing, um, leave them for a few days 
take shower, not bath. Okay, showers, not a bath. Um, don't change the dressing. Um, take it off after two or three days. You must check if it's an infection. Look for red parts. And if you have pain, you might have an infection. Tell your GP immediately if this happens, okay? Okay, what about after the operation? I can't believe that I have an operation and just go home. Um, you'll be fine. Just take painkillers. And remember to eat properly. Okay, what should I eat? Oh, um, before I talk about that, um, don't lift heavy things for four weeks, one month. Eat soft food with lots of fibre. So no lifting? Look, I know I can get two weeks off work, but my boss has already said that, but lifting is part of my job. I can't go back to work and not stack shelves. Well, that's for you to work out with your boss. Hmm. Okay. Okay, then. That's about it. We're done for now. Um, best of luck with the operation. Okay. So now that we've listened to the sample, let's analyze it using our speaking criteria checklist. Let's begin with how Sally started off. Remember, checklist item number one was introduce yourself in a polite and friendly way and build a relationship with the patient using sympathetic language and tone of voice. Let's listen again and hear how Sally did. I guess you're the hernia guy? Yeah, yes. Well, Sally is not off to a good start, is she? She didn't introduce herself politely at all, and referring to her patient as the hernia guy is unprofessional. Her tone is very impersonal, so she missed the opportunity to build a relationship with her patient. So she did not do very well with her introduction. Let's listen to hear if she handles the second checklist item better. Our checklist item two is Inquire about your patient's condition, listen to their concerns, and be responsive to their questions to better understand their perspective or circumstances. Remember, this aligns with the first prompt on the role play card, which is find out about the difficulties the patient has been experiencing. Let's listen to how well Sally did with this prompt by inquiring, listening, and responding to her patient. Your operation is, um, tomorrow, right? Yes. The prompt wanted Sally to find out more about the patient, such as how he is feeling and whether he has any concerns or worries. Sally did not do any of this, did she? We heard Sally frame the conversation more as a statement instead of using language that would prompt the patient to give information about himself. This means, first, she wasn't patient-centric and second, failed to adequately inquire about the patient's condition as per checklist item two. So to summarize this point, Sally has missed a couple of chances to meet important speaking criteria, specifically items one, introducing herself, and item two, inquiring about the patient. Let's see how she does from here as we move on to the explaining part of the conversation. The explain requirement is evident in the second prompt, which asks Sally to explain the purpose of the surgery and the use of the laparoscopic surgical approach. This task aligns with items three and four on our checklist, which cover information giving and gathering. Listen to how Sally explained the purpose of the surgery. Well, hernias are painful. The operation might fix that. The surgeon will use a laparoscope to um, push the inguinal hernia back in your stomach and put some pyrotex mesh in to fix the hole. This is to make the weak place strong again. Keeping in mind that Prompt 2 wanted Sally to explain the purpose of the surgery and the laparoscopic surgical procedure, there are a couple of problems with Sally's response. First, she did not explain the purpose of the procedure clearly at all. In fact, she made it sound kind of scary. A second thing is that she has used quite a lot of technical language. What do inguinal and pariatex mean? Our checklist items four and seven remind us not to use technical language. Remember, this is not a test of your medical knowledge. It is a test of your ability to communicate and speak clearly. 
Let's listen to the patient's response and how this leads Sally to address the third prompt, which is also an explain type task. The third prompt asks Sally to explain about laparoscopic surgery and how it is quicker and less intrusive. Listen closely. Oh, okay, so I'm, I'm going to have a big cut. The surgeon puts three holes or four holes in your groin to put the laparoscope in. It's small. Then we um, put a dressing on the, um, the wound and you can go home. We have a few big problems here. First, Sally didn't directly respond to the patient's question. This is another example of her not being responsive or patient-centric in line with checklist item two. Second, she hasn't explained things very well and is not very clear. For example, are the holes small or is the laparoscope small, or both? Her giving of information, as per our checklist item four, is neither clear nor simple. A third thing is that she, again, did not deal with the prompt task, which requires that she explain how laparoscopic surgery is quicker and less intrusive than open surgery. Finally, looking at our checklist item six, her speech is not smooth or fluent. She has ums, ahs, and hesitations. Okay, given Sally's response, notice how our patient reacts to her explanation. Let's listen. Ouch, that sounds like it will really hurt. Let's stop right here for a second. What Sally should do now is assure him that the procedure won't be as painful as it sounds. This would give Sally a chance to be sympathetic and responsive to the patient. Let's listen to how she responds. Well, the, the dressing, um, leave them for a few days. Take shower, not bath. Okay, we just heard Sally mention leaving the dressing on the wound for a few days without responding to her patient's concerns about the pain. Rather than answering her patient's questions relating to prompt three, she has moved on to a different topic entirely. The question is, which prompt? Looking again at the prompt tasks, prompt four asks Sally to explain the immediate post-operative period, emphasizing that there will be two weeks recovery before being able to return to work after six weeks. Okay, so prompt four wants her to explain more about the post-operative recovery times, but instead, she is advising her patient about wound care. So something is not lining up here. Let's look at prompt five. It refers to advising about care after discharge and specifically mentions wound care. Hmm, she has skipped prompt four entirely, hasn't she? This means that the conversation is now out of sequence. Let's try to keep up with Sally. So now we know Sally has jumped ahead to the fifth and last prompt. We think she is addressing what we call the advising part of the conversation, which is mostly about giving information as per checklist item four. To catch up with her, let's go back and listen to Sally's last statement again. Well, the, the dressing, um, leave them for a few days. Take shower, not bath. As we already know, Sally is struggling and she has missed talking about prompt four entirely. Working with what we have, we hear that the most obvious problem is that, looking at our checklist item five, we hear that her speech is unclear and her pronunciation difficult to understand. It is not smooth and fluent as per checklist item six. She is also struggling with grammar and is using overly simple vocabulary and struggling to demonstrate her ability to meet the criteria set out in our checklist item eight. Let's keep listening. Okay, showers, not a bath. Um, don't change the dressing. Um, take it off after two or three days. You must check if it's an infection. Look for red parts. And if you have pain, you might have an infection. Tell your GP immediately if this happens, okay? Well, I won't spend much time on this because we have seen many of the same mistakes before. Sally is struggling with her fluency in grammar and is not giving information clearly. More importantly is what the patient says next. Okay, what about after the operation? I can't believe that I have an operation and just go home. What I want to point out here is that the interlocutor 
even though playing the role of the patient has tried very subtly to nudge Sally back on track by asking, what about after the operation? Let's listen to see how she deals with this helpful hint. This is an example of how the interlocutor may ask questions with important hints that might indirectly guide the sequence of the conversation if you are listening. Let's listen to hear how Sally responded to this nudge. Um, you'll be fine. Just take painkillers. And remember to eat properly. Okay, what should I eat? Oh, um, before I talk about that, um, don't lift heavy things for four weeks, one month. Eat soft food with lots of fiber. Well, Sally's responses in this advising part of the conversation are quite disjointed. So, I suggest then rather than continuing with this, I want to listen and use our checklist to analyze an example of a high-scoring sample response for the same roleplay card. Let's begin by looking at item one on our checklist, the introduction. As I mentioned before, introducing yourself is like addressing an unwritten prompt that we can use as an opportunity to establish a relationship and demonstrate understanding of the patient. Let's listen to how Sally did this time. Hello, you must be Paul. Is it okay if I use your first name? Hello, yes, please call me Paul. Pleased to meet you. I'm Sally. I'm a registered surgical nurse here. I'll explain a few things about your operation and give you some information about what to do when you go home. Please feel free to ask any questions you might have. I'll try my best to answer them. Thank you. Nice to meet you, Sally. Sally's introduction is good. You heard her tone was sympathetic and warm right from the beginning. She was polite, introduced herself, told Paul her role, and established her expertise. She personalized the conversation using Paul's name and made it clear that she was happy to answer any of his questions, making him feel more comfortable by being patient-centric. In a short few sentences, she ticked off checklist item one. She introduced herself in a friendly manner and began establishing a relationship with Paul. Checklist item two, she inquired about Paul in a patient-centric way, starting with open questions. Checklist item five, she used clear speech and pronunciation. Checklist item six, she used smooth speech without hesitation. Let's move on to the first prompt on the role play card requiring inquiring about Paul's condition. Let's listen. So, as you know, you have your hernia operation tomorrow. Tell me, how are you feeling? I'm a bit sore, but coping all right. The hernia is a bit painful, isn't it? Are you familiar with what a hernia operation is? Yes, my GP explained that to me already. So, Sally did a good job here using checklist item two. She moved from open to closed questions when she asked Paul questions. An important piece of information Paul told her was that he is coping okay. She was able to demonstrate a sense of understanding and responsiveness when she acknowledged that he must feel some pain. Most importantly, she inquired about how much he understood regarding the operation he will be having tomorrow. Okay, let's move on to prompt number two of the role play card, an explain prompt that asks her to describe the purpose of the operation and procedure. Listen to how she handles all of the linguistic criteria, checklist items five, six, seven, and eight. Pay attention to the clarity of her speech and pronunciation, smoothness and fluency, her use of vocabulary, and non-technical language and grammar. Okay, that's good. Let's talk about your operation now. Your surgeon will use something called a laparoscope. A laparoscope is a very small camera she uses to see your hernia. She also uses it to push the hernia back into your stomach. After she does that, she will cover the hole caused by the hernia with a surgical mesh. The mesh will help make the weak place stronger. Do you have any questions, Paul? Sally's explanation of the purpose of Paul's operation was easy to understand. Her pronunciation was clear. Her speech was smooth and fluent, and she avoided using overly technical language. In addressing the prompt, she gave Paul a good explanation of the purpose of the operation. 
to push the hernia back into his stomach and how a laparoscope would be used by the surgeon. She also paused to ask Paul whether he understood and had any questions. OK, so am I going to have a big cut? No, you won't. This procedure is less intrusive than open surgery and it's quicker to perform too, which is good. Your surgeon will put three or four small holes in your groin. These are holes to put the laparoscope in. They'll be small. And a special glue is used for closing the holes after the operation is done. No stitches. Your surgeon will finish by putting a dressing on the small wounds. And if all is good, you can go home. Am I explaining clearly? Uh, yes, I, I think I've got it. Sally did a pretty good job with the second role play card prompt, didn't she? Paul's question and response gave her a good opportunity to transition to prompt number three and begin to explain more about this surgical procedure and use of a laparoscope. Paul's question, am I going to have a big cut, is an example of how the interlocutor may give you cues to guide the conversation. Here, the cue given by the examiner is to give information about the wound caused by the surgery. She handled the prompt and the examiner's cue well by explaining how laparoscopic surgery is less invasive and does not require stitches. Again, Sally ends her explanation asking whether Paul understands. Paul's response is a cue that all is good and that Sally can move on to the next prompt. The next prompt appears to be an explained prompt, but is more an advising prompt. Prompt number four asks Sally to give Paul important information and advice about his recovery after the operation. Let's listen. Note that Paul's question is also a cue given by the interlocutor that aligns with prompt number four. Okay, what about after the operation? I can't believe that I have an operation and just go home. If everything is okay, yes, you can go home. A few things you need to know are that, most importantly, you need to rest and take things slowly for about two weeks so that you recover more quickly. You can start working again two weeks after the operation, but you need to make sure not to strain yourself for four weeks, especially heavy lifting. It takes about six weeks to fully recover. Is this going to be a problem for you at work? I can get two weeks off work, my boss has already said that, but I am not sure about the straining part. That's going to be hard. Uh, I can't go back to work and not stack shelves, you know. It is part of my job. Right, I understand. But it's also very important not to lift heavy things. Maybe you could speak with your employer or you can work together with a colleague. You mean get help lifting? I'll try, but it will be difficult. Okay, Paul's questions about recovery and work pose a bit of a challenge. The challenge is the overlap between prompt four about recovery times and prompt five, which asks Sally to talk about care after discharge. What has happened is that she has covered part of the information required by prompt five while talking about prompt four because of Paul's questions. The critical thing to remember is that this won't be considered an error and not to get flustered by feeling that you are now out of sequence. The best thing for Sally to do here is to push on smoothly and fluently. Let's listen to how she did. I suggest you talk to your boss again and do the best you can to avoid lifting. One quick thing to note with Sally's reply here is that she has responded in a way that is neutral and non-judgmental and framed her advice as a suggestion rather than having it sound like an order. Before we listen to the next passages, I want you to listen for a few things. Sally is now well into the advising phase of the role play. In line with our checklist item four, we want to listen for whether she gives her advice concisely, clearly, and in an easy to understand way. Let's listen. Okay, there are a few things I need to tell you about caring for the dressing. After you are discharged, you are okay to leave it for a few days. You can shower because it's waterproof, but you should only take showers, not bath. Okay, a shower, not a bath. Yes, and there is no need to change the dressing. 
just take it off after two or three days. After you do that, it's important to keep the wound clean and dry. Don't worry about the glue, it'll disappear as the wound heals. What you must check is if the wound is showing signs of infection. Signs of infection are if the wound begins to look more swollen or red, and if you start feeling any pain. If this happens, you need to go see your GP immediately, okay? Okay, I understand. It might be a little painful at first, but you can use painkillers. Ordinary painkillers are usually okay. When you go home, you'll need to be a little careful. For example, when you go to the toilet, you shouldn't strain. So you need to make sure you're not constipated. Um, it is a good idea if you eat food with more fiber, more fruit, just to make sure. Okay, but I don't usually have a problem with constipation. That's good. Okay, um, do you have any questions? No, I think it's clear now. That's good. Okay then, just be careful about your wound after the operation. She handled this well, didn't she? As per checklist items four and five, she gave advice clearly and simply, avoided using technical language, and sought confirmation from Paul that he understood. She used grammar and vocabulary as per checklist item eight, and was told by Paul that he understood and seemed comfortable. By now, you should have a really good feel for the most important criteria in the OET speaking test. If you'd like to download the simplified checklist in addition to the full sample responses we listened to in this video, click the link in the description. As always, if you're looking for OET roleplay sample task cards, sign up for free and prepare with us at e2testprep.com. Good luck.